Claire Highbloom interviews Jesus on a subject of Christian religion. The recording took place in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia, on the 4th of March, 2013. This is session one, part two. Number 10. Is the practice of praying in tongues that some Christians follow beneficial to their desire to connect to God? Well, before we can really answer that question, we need to look at all of these things that are called the gifts of the Spirit. Mm. Um, because I feel that a lot of Christians believe these gifts, such as prophecy, uh, speaking in tongues and other types of gifts, a lot of people believe they are the gifts of the Holy Spirit and they're not the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Ah. So what we need to do is define what is a gift of the Holy Spirit compared to what is a gift of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And then we'll be able to look at the specific gifts of the Spirit and this okay. I'm speaking in tongues. So with the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a conduit like a pipe, an energy of God that allows God to connect to the human and pass love from God's soul into the human soul. So that is its only purpose. It has no other purpose. It doesn't have a voice. It doesn't have any other purpose. It doesn't control what a person thinks. It's not a, gift. It's not a, a thing that gives truth. It's not a thing that uh, provides any other mechanism from God aside from the divine love flowing through it. And the reason why I called it the Holy Spirit was because it's the spirit that enabled the person to become holy. Mm. And it's the only spirit of God, in fact, that I've discovered that allows the, con the, the divine love of God to flow into the human soul. And for that reason, I felt it was the most holy of all of God's spirits. If you, and when I refer to God's spirits, I'm referring to the active forces that come from God, okay. all of the energies, if you like, that come from God. So when we talk about a gift of the spirit, we are not talking about the gift of that the Holy Spirit brings. Right. So speaking in tongues is not a gift of the Holy Spirit. The only gift that the Holy Spirit brings to the human soul is the gift of divine love. Mm. All other gifts come from other things. So that's the first thing we must understand. Mm. The second thing we need to understand is that when the Bible mm. refers to the word spirit, it can be referring to many different things. It can be referring to a spirit person, for example. It can be referring to a type of emotion, a, a different energy or emotion that a person has. It's like you could say the spirit of violence, mm -hmm. the spirit of happiness. You know, these are all emotional feelings that we feel sort of like a spirit. And in fact, the, the way they transmit is that they have an energy and a colour that goes between one soul and another soul. So, so they are actually an actual spiritual uh, an energetic transmission of, of the emotion. So if I'm angry with you, for example, you will feel it inside of yourself because there'll be a transmission of a very red, mm -hmm. reddish, a very bright, reddy, black feeling coming out of me into you. And, and it's actually something that a spirit can see. Mm -hmm. a, a person in the spirit world can see this spirit or energy that comes at, at me out of my soul and into yours. So you could say that's a spirit. Then you could also say that there are things that are things like the spirit that are of the spirit body. So as you are aware now, we have a physical body and a spirit body. And in fact, Paul said that, you know, that we have a physical body as well as a spirit one. Now, you could say that the gifts of the spirit are all related to the spirit body. So the gift of speaking in tongues is related to the spirit body of the person in okay. some way. Does that make sense? Mm, mm. Now, how it's related is through a process. And, and if we look at how the gift is used, that is one part of the question. And then the other part of the question is, what is the gift in itself? Now, the gift of speaking in tongues is the ability to speak in other languages. Mm. Transmitting divine truth, but, but to be more specific, even though the speaker does not know the language. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it gives me the ability to speak in another language without me as the speaker knowing the language. And to clarify, the spirit comes from my own spirit. Well, this is the question, isn't this it? Is the question. Because it's potentially from a spirit in the spirit world. Right. 
working through the energy of your own spirit body, oh. transmitting information to your mind, and then you have clarity to speak it to mm. somebody else. Does that make sense? Yes. So if we look at how speaking in tongues in the Bible was first used, we can, help ident we can identify what the issues with speaking in tongues is all about. So if you look in Acts chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, and I'm reading from the uh, New International Version here, it says... Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Mm. So this was the first account in the Bible of speaking in tongues. Peter and a number of other people at this point in time, this is after Pentecost, they, they became infused with spirit and they had the ability to speak in tongues. Mm. Now, the Holy Spirit connected to them at Pentecost and because they became into a condition of truth and love. They also had a desire to receive divine love and the Holy Spirit connected with them and divine love flowed into their souls. Uh -huh. Now, the divine love in their souls caused a change in their soul, mm. which then impacted upon their spirit body which meant their spirit body could now do things mm. that it couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. So Peter could never speak in tongues mm. before. And many of the others who were listed here could never speak in tongues before. This is the first occasion where they could speak in tongues. I just need to have a cough. So the purpose of speaking in tongues was not to just provide a heap of gibberish to people who could not understand. It was to provide divine truth to the people who could hear it in their own mm -hmm. language. Yes. That was its purpose. Yes. It had a direct loving purpose. Now, this is the case with each gift. Each gift that we have, whether it's prophecy or speaking in tongues or other gifts like that, they can be used in a loving purpose mm. or an unloving purpose. Mm. And it just depends on which way our soul decision mm -hmm. takes us, our desire, desire takes us as to whether we will have a loving purpose or an unloving purpose in the dissemination of the gift. Now, in this case, in the, the first occasion of speaking in tongues, it was obviously a loving purpose. Almost 3,000 people from all different walks of life in different countries, they were all Jews, mm -hmm. but they all come from different countries for the, for the Passover celebration. They all spoke different languages yeah. and they heard Peter speaking in their own language. Mm. Mm. That was the power. They were hearing the divine truth being spoken in their own language. Yep. And that's yeah. what caused a huge attraction, of course, to the truth and caused them to listen. And many of them, as a result, as it says, decided to follow it as a result of them, of, of them hearing the truth in their own language. Now, that's a case of a gift of the spirit body yeah. being used yes. in a positive direction. Yes. Now, Peter didn't know the language, mm. so the language had to come from somewhere. Mm. And where it came from was from spirits in the spirit world who could speak the languages of these people, but who also knew divine truth. Mm. So these spirits in the spirit world who could speak divine truth could now connect to Peter because he had received the Holy Spirit and received the divine love through the Holy Spirit. His soul was transformed to the point where he could now hear other spirits mm. yeah. and he could now s transmit information from mm. other spirits to people. And as a result, they started talking to him and, and they started using his body to transmit the information in another language, even though Peter himself did not know the language because mm. he, he could only speak Hebrew and Aramaic. Yes. So uh, that was the process of speaking in tongues. Now, it can also be used in a, in, a, in a terrible way, in a very unloving way. So if we look at Paul's words now, if we look at Corinthians, 1 first, uh, first Corinthians 14, Paul spoke about the unloving ways in which you can use speaking in tongues. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Mm. Now, the gift of prophecy is different to the gift of tongues in the sense that the gift of prophecy is still a spirit speaking to the person. It's not the Holy Spirit. Mm. Mm. See, most Christians believe it's the Holy Spirit, mm. yeah. but it is not because the Holy Spirit doesn't speak. 
And the Holy Spirit doesn't give prophecy. All the purpose of the Holy Spirit is, is to be a conduit for divine love to flow into the soul. That's its purpose. That's its only purpose. It does not have a voice. It is not an entity. And it does not give anything else to the soul. This, when he talks about the gift of prophecy, the gift of prophecy is the same gift of prophecy that Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of yes. these, Daniel, all of these ones had, which is the gift of being able to hear what a spirit says and say it in your own language to a per group of people who are hearing yep. and therefore upbuild the people who are hearing and yourself. So it's spirits, and they can be dark spirits or they could be bright spirits, mm. transmitting information through a person and that person then transmits the information to a group of people who listen to it. That's the gift of prophecy. And Paul said he desires that people prophesy instead of speak in tongues. And the reason why is because speaking in tongues is often not in the language of the people who are listening. Mm. And uh, whereas prophesying was always in the language of the people that were hearing. And therefore it could be beneficial. Mm. He says, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. And I would even dispute that particular claim. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. Mm. Now, if you think about it, if God is a God of love and God is trying to give us truth, would God try to create mystery? Mm. Obviously not. If mystery is being created, then it is not coming from God, nor is it coming from the Holy Spirit. It is coming from a spirit in the spirit world, yeah. a person who is transmitting the information. And Paul's saying, often these people were speaking in tongues, right? And basically all they were doing was showing off. Yeah. They, it was having no effect on the yeah. hearer because the hearer could not understand. And it was having very little effect even on the person because they could not even understand what they were saying. Mm. They just had this feeling with the spirit and said a whole heap of things mm. as a mm -hmm. result. He said, but everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement and comfort. Yes. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies mm. the church. Mm. Mm. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. Mm. He who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues unless he interprets mm -hmm. so that the church may be edified. Yep. So what he's basically saying here is a basic understanding of the rules of mediumship or channeling. And I know most Christians don't like those terms very much <laughs> because of the different prohibitions of such in the Old Testament version, in the Old Testament parts of the Bible. But if they think about it carefully, I spoke to spirits when I was on earth in the first century. There is records of me speaking to evil spirits mm -hmm. and speaking to good spirits. In the transfiguration, I spoke to good spirits. Right. In, uh, with regard to expelling demons, I spoke to evil spirits. Now, if I spoke to spirits, there should be no prohibition of you speaking to one. Mm. And if that's the case, that's what most of the people understood. The most, all the Christians understood this. So the Christians understood that they could speak to spirits uh, because it was something that I showed them that mm. they could do. And so what they did was they uh, often encouraged the speaking to spirits. But unfortunately they often didn't know what kind of spirit mm. they were speaking to. And this is why one of the other apostles said, you've got to try the spirits okay. to see which one you're speaking to. So yes. in other words, you've got to get to know them a bit and understand where they're coming from and understand their background and understand you know, their feelings mm. before you actually know whether they're speaking the truth mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. Now, many people who speak in tongues are just open conduits for spirits who all they want to do is speak in their own tongue to somebody on earth. It has no benefit to any of their audience. Mm. It has no benefit to themselves. In fact, often it can be degrading to themselves because the spirit might not be in a good condition. Mm. Now, the problem with that kind of speaking in tongues is it doesn't help any listener. It doesn't help the person who's doing it. And it doesn't help the spirit because the spirit and the person who's doing it are just in their own addictions with each other, trying to get glory mm. that has no purpose. Mm. Mm. What Paul was saying is the speaking in tongues or, yeah. or if you, and prophesying that is beneficial yes. is the speaking in tongues and prophesying that people can understand. Mm. You have to be able to understand it before it's going to benefit you. And he was saying that there is no problem having these gifts of the spirit 
or these gifts of speaking in tongues or prophesying, which are all about mediumship abilities, mm -hmm. channeling spirits. They, they are all possible and many people in Pentecostal religious churches mm -hmm. engage them. There's nothing wrong with engaging them with the exception of when they're engaged out of harmony with love. Yes. If they're engaged out of harmony with love, they will damage everybody, including the person doing it. Mm. If they're engaged in harmony with love, then they can benefit everybody, including the person doing mm. it. And that should be the underlying principle of speaking in tongues. So the real question in terms of what a Christian should focus on, a Christian should focus, uh, is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. Because mm. this is what he said there. He said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, mm. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal, right? So what's he saying there? He's saying, if I have these gifts of the spirit, which by the way, anyone can have, we don't need to have any special development of love to have them. And that's what Paul's implying. You can actually have the gift without having any love at all in you. And if you have the gift without having any love in you, it's like you might as well just be banging something, mm, you know, making, playing, a, lot of making a lot of racket mm, mm. And, because it has no benefit whatsoever sure. on the rest of the world. So what Paul focused on in 1 Corinthians 13 was he was focused on you must develop in love if you're truly going to have any spiritual development. So in answer to your question about developing speaking in tongues in order to connect to God or connect to the Holy Spirit, my suggestion is this. Speaking in tongues does not connect you with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm because it is not the Holy Spirit that you're connecting to mm -hmm. when you speak in tongues. It is a spirit mm -hmm. and your own spirit body. In addition to that, speaking in tongues does not automatically mean you are more loving. Mm -hmm. And as Paul correctly said, developing in love should be the focus of the Christian, not developing other things. Yeah. Now, as a subsequent development of love, you may be able to speak in tongues, and you may be able to prophesy. Mm. But it will, if you focus on developing those gifts without developing love, you may as well be a, sound, mm. a clashing symbol, as Paul said. It is pointless to do such a thing. Mm. So, so my feeling in terms of answer to this question for you is I feel Christians need to focus more on developing their gift of love, their love of God, their love of their neighbour, all of those things that they must focus on developing. And, and we might talk about that more in, in yeah. terms of daily practice in another question. Yeah. But, but if they focus on developing the so-called gifts of the spirit without developing love, it is completely pointless to their own soul mm -hmm. and completely pointless to the souls of the people who are listening. Mm -hmm. So these Pentecostal churches where people flail around on the ground speaking gibberish that nobody else can translate or understand, it is totally pointless. Not only pointless, it is very selfish because it is imposing gibberish mm -hmm. upon a congregation that deserves better than gibberish. It deserves to have a more, you know, yeah. information about yeah. connection with God, not just gibberish coming from a spirit and a person on earth who's yeah, yeah, yeah. influenced by a spirit who's, who's not in a condition of love. Mm. So what I recommended to people in the first century is the same thing I recommend now, and that is if you, if you make sure that your development in love is your primary focus, these other gifts will come to you, mm. but you'll also know how to use them lovingly. Yes. yes. If you focus on developing the gifts, as many New Age people do and some Christians do, focus on developing the gifts without developing in love, then you will be able to use the gift, but you won't ever be loving. Mm -hmm. And there's no point to that. There's no point. Because the light and brightness of your soul is completely dependent on the love. Mm -hmm. It's not dependent on the gifts. I've seen very, very dark souls having the gift of tongues mm -hmm. and very dark souls having the gift of prophesying mm -hmm. but having no love inside of themselves. And when they pass into the spirit world, they often pass with no love inside of themselves and so therefore they pass into a hellish condition mm. and they have a very harsh surrounding environment as a result. They believed themselves to be developed because they were speaking in tongues. Yes. They believed they were developed because they were prophesying yeah. but true development only comes from development in love. Mm. Mm. 
And I feel that's the main principle that we need to explain, understand Excellent. with all of the development that we can make in the gifts of the spirit. Mm, mm. Mm. And that would be for other people, people who see, I don't know, energies or see auras, etc. Exactly the same principle mm. applies. Just because you can see an aura or an energy, it does not mean that you are developed in love. In fact, yeah. I've seen many people who can see auras and energies who are very dark and mm. not developed in love at all. Mm. So, so again, the same thing applies. Developing in love yeah. is the only real yeah. spiritual development that a person can make. Now, yeah. there's two types of love. One type is the love that you express from within yourself to another, which I call the natural love that exists within the human soul. And then there's this other type of love that we have the capacity to receive through the Holy Spirit, which is the divine love of God that mm. can enter our soul and transform us. My suggestion to people is to choose the second Mm. way of development mm. um, but both ways of development will grow your soul mm -hmm. but the second way of development through connecting through the Holy Spirit with God's love that will grow the soul infinitely yeah whereas there will be a limitation of yeah. your growth if you connect in natural love mm. Mm. and I implied that in many of my um, illustrations in the first century as well that there were two different types of w ways you could develop your love right but um, I just feel that we need to be careful that we don't get hung up on all of these like fancy things that all seem exciting at the time and forget the excitement of developing in love, mm. which mm. is the real mm. thing that's exciting. You imagine, mm. well, you think about the earth that we have now. If all of us on the earth developed in love, yeah. It wouldn't matter what gifts or no, lack of gifts any of us had. <laughs> we'd all treat each other more loving. You, you imagine how the world would be then yeah. in comparison to how it is now. But if, you, if we can all speak in tongues but don't have any love, how does that change the world? We'd all be speaking gibberish <laughs> half the time <laughs> and, uh, and dark spirits would be saying their things through us and all that kind of, which oh, often does happen, and, uh, and all be very negative because there's no love involved. Mm -hmm. So that's the damaging part of it sure. all. I also feel that for Christians in particular, we need to not... Con con um, not confuse the gifts of the Spirit with the Holy Spirit. Mm. We need to be very, very careful that we do not confuse That's these two That's a wonderful things. distinction. Yeah. I had never realised that before. Yeah, because it, it's that confusion that causes people then to misrepresent the Holy Spirit yes. and what it does. You see, yes. they start then viewing the Holy Spirit as a person because yes. they can hear a voice. Yes, yes. Not realising... They're hearing a voice, so it's not the Holy Spirit. Mm. It's a spirit talking to them, claiming to be the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's not good. No way. If you think about it, mm. it's not good for a spirit to be claiming to be a Holy Spirit of God when it's not the Holy Spirit of God. It's just a spirit who's lived in the past on earth. Yeah. That, that, that's a false claim. Oh. And, a, and a spirit who claims that, who's speaking us, to us in a voice, is lying to us. And we'd be able to know straight away if we know that the Holy Spirit is not a voice. It is not going to be able to speak to us. It is an energy of God that transmits love to us. And we know that's the role of the Holy Spirit. Then we will, of course, be very mistrustful of any spirit coming along saying, I'm the Holy Spirit, listen to me. Mm -hmm. I see many Christians saying they are talking to the Holy Spirit when they're just talking to a first sphere, quite dark Christian spirit who's claiming to be the Holy Spirit in order to transmit a whole heap of information that is false to the person. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very damaging to the person. And it's also quite damaging to the spirit. Mm. So my, my suggestion is that you need to have a very clear idea what the Holy Spirit is. And once you have that clear idea, you will realise that these gifts of the spirit are completely separate to the Holy Spirit. And then you'll be much more careful in the way you use these gifts of the spirit. Mm. And you won't make presumptions or assumptions that you're currently making about these gifts. You won't assume that just because you're hearing a voice that's talking about some kind of form of Christianity that it's coming from God. You won't be making that assumption anymore because you know that it could be just a spirit claiming to be God or a spirit claiming to be the Holy Spirit mm. talking to you. Mm. And many, many spirits do this just in order to, to mislead people on earth. Mm. And many Christians are being misled by very dark spirits as a result of that. And this is why sometimes you hear some Christian people on earth saying, I was told to go and kill that person. The Holy Spirit told me. Mm. 
well, certainly not the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. that told you to do that. Mm -hmm. It was a spirit who was very dark, mm -hmm. who you've believed your whole life is the Holy Spirit, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And it has a voice that you can hear and you're just acting upon that voice. That's very, very damaging. There have been people historically that have done things according to the Holy Spirit or what the Holy Spirit has told them, which have been completely out of line with love which is an indication that it wasn't the Holy Spirit <laughs> <laughs> that they were connecting to. Yeah, yeah. So it's very important to understand that distinction. Mm. Wonderful. Mm. That's wonderful. With regard to the Holy Spirit, though, when we connect to the Holy Spirit and divine love flows into the soul, the soul grows in its capacity, in its gifts of the Spirit. So it is important for us to understand that Connecting to the Holy Spirit and, connect, and receiving divine love does in, increase our capacity to speak in tongues. Mm. It increases our capacity to prophesy. It increases our capacity to see spirits. So in the first century, I could easily see spirits and talk to them because, I, because it, the, the, the love, the divine love that had, was in my soul had changed my soul capacities to the point where I could see the people that mm. I was speaking with mm. Mm. and hear them while I'm speaking to them mm. and talk to them about the truth, about what they were doing. And this is the beauty of doing, connecting with God's love first. And that's why in the first century I said, seek first God's love and yes. all these other things will be added to yes. you. Yes. And that's what I suggest that Christians generally but also every person on this planet mm. decides to do. Mm. Seek first God's love and all these other fascinating things mm. that we can enjoy and have fun with mm. will all come to us in time. Mm. Mm. Wonderful, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> now, number 11. And which erroneous beliefs give conventional Christians the most difficulty in finding the narrow path to God? Well, um, this question was interesting when you, when you first uh, listed it for me because I, I just thought, well, I could list so many of <laughs> beliefs here. That, um, <laughs> because it, uh, beliefs are a very individual experience. Mm -hmm. There are certain beliefs that we imbibe with our whole heart and soul and those particular beliefs, of course, can have a terribly detrimental effect on our soul. Mm -hmm. There are beliefs that we hear yeah. uh, but we don't really go yeah. with. So, for example, all of your life as a Christian, you would have heard of the Trinity, mm. but you've never really believed that Jesus is God. No. You know, you, you've, you, know. You, don't, you didn't know, but it's not something that you firmly thought, yes, no. he's definitely God. No, no, definitely. It? So you could say under those conditions that the belief entered your mind, mm. but it had, didn't really enter your heart. No, it didn't enter the heart. It went around and around, <laughs> around, around, around <laughs> and around. And you couldn't make sense of it, and you couldn't make sense of it, and so it never went down, <laughs> you could basically say, right? And this is the case with many beliefs that we mm. hear, no matter what religious profession we are, mm. is that there are some beliefs that enter our heart because we have an openness to believing them, mm. and not necessarily because they're right either, yeah. but we have an openness to believing them. Whereas other beliefs only enter our head mm -hmm. and they don't enter our heart. So, so, for example, in the 1800s, there was a general Christian belief that black people were cursed. Mm -hmm. Now, it entered the hearts of the people who engaged slaves. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, they felt justified in having black slavery because they, with their heart, engaged the concept that the blacks were cursed mm -hmm. from Cain. From yes, Canaan, yes, you know? Yes. Now, the Christians who did not agree with that, in other words, the Christians who heard that teaching but it never entered mm. their hearts, could not embrace, embrace slavery. They could see that slavery was wrong. Mm. So those Christians didn't embrace slavery when the other Christians who let this belief enter their heart could embrace slavery. Mm. That's yeah. an example of how a belief affects us. Perfect. Yeah. Now... It is mostly the beliefs that go into our heart that affect our life in the spirit world and in our future. Mm. And so with this question that you've asked, it is mostly the heartfelt beliefs that cause us mm. the most trouble when we arrive in the spirit world. Mm. And they also cause us the most trouble here on earth mm. because it's a very similar position. Now, what are, so the question then becomes, uh, what are the... Belief systems that are Christian belief systems that enter the heart 
that damage the heart so right. much that it makes it very difficult for a person to get out of those belief systems. Okay. And, and this is what I feel they are. The very first and biggest one, the concept of God. Mm. The concept of God in general Christianity is that God is loving, but love includes punishment and violence. Mm. Because there is an expectation that God will violently destroy the wicked. Mm. So there is a justification of this belief by saying the wicked deserve destruction. Mm. Now, it, it, no one ever considers, of course, that God might not have made a system where the wicked need to be destroyed. The fact, the fact is that God is very much more clever than that. The way God made the system is the wicked need to be corrected, mm. not destroyed. Mm. So God made a corrective uh, system for the wicked, not a destructive system for the wicked. This is yes. something that we need to understand. Yes. However, most Christians want there to be a destructive condition for the wicked. So they are very open to the concept that love involves punishment mm. and not only punishment but violence mm. and as a result and and this is partially because many of them have been punished by their parents mm. while they're being said while the parents are saying i love you mm. i'm belting you with a stick because the bible tells me i should mm. but i love you right but if you were belting an adult with a stick it would call, be called assault it's right, right? so so this is all part of why people have imbibed into their heart this concept about God, this concept that God is a violent, punishing God at times, and that that is love. Mm -hmm. That is the destructive belief. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that single destructive belief has a huge effect on many Christians when they pass mm -hmm. for many reasons. One reason is when they pass over, many Christians are not in the condition they'd hoped to be. And therefore, they usually end up in some place in the first dimension of the spirit world, in what is called the hells. Now, because they've been taught that they can't get out of the hells and God's going to punish them forever, mm. they don't even try to get out. Mm. They don't even understand that they can get out. Mm. And that causes a stagnation of their soul for hundreds of years, sometimes thousands of years. I've seen some Christians who have stagnated souls for over a thousand years as a result of that one teaching affecting them. So this concept that God is an unloving God or a violent, punishing God who destroys wicked, the wicked, is a false concept of God that most Christians have imbibed through their reading of the Bible and as a result of believing that the Bible is God's word. And they have forced themselves to believe it. But not only that, they readily accept it because their own parents were often violent mm. while at the same time saying that they were loving. So there's a predisposition to, to, to actually yes. imbibing the belief. Yes. And as a result of that, they then feel that the uh, concept of God is true. Mm. But it is not true. And every time you have a false concept of God, you cannot ever be at one with God. Mm. You cannot ever be in harmony with God's love when you have a false concept yeah. of God. So that is a very damaging thing to do. The second belief that I feel has a huge effect on Christians is there's the beliefs, the false beliefs about myself. Mm. The false beliefs that I am God has a huge effect on most Christians. It has a huge negative effect on many of them because they sort of think of me as some kind of special, unique God-man. Yeah. And therefore they do not believe that they were, are capable of the same way of acting that I was capable of in the first century. Mm. They don't believe themselves to be capable of it because they believe themselves to be sinners. Yeah. And yeah. they believe themselves that, that sin is inherent within them mm. and cannot be removed. Now, I stated quite categorically, and it's actually recorded in the Bible, that you could become perfect. But most Christians ignore those verses, thinking that that's impossible, mm. particularly while they're on earth. Mm. And as a result of that, they compare themselves with me. They always come up short yeah. in their own opinion. And then as a result of that, they attack themselves and break themselves and punish themselves, which actually means they never get close to God. Mm. In addition, they believe that I am God. Mm. And that is false too. They're trying to connect to somebody who is not God. I cannot give them divine love. 
only divine love only comes from God. Mm -hmm. They can pray to me till they're blue in the face and nothing will change unless they have a feeling for God's love. Then something will change. And, and so all of these beliefs about me, including the beliefs of my sacrifice, for example, are all beliefs that have caused huge amount of pro problems for Christians after they've passed. This concept that my blood saves them from their sin mm. is directly opposite the concept that I tried to teach that is present in the Bible, that every single person will be responsible for their own sin. Mm. Mm. All right? Now, what yeah. they're basically trying to say is that I will become responsible by their belief in me uh, that erases their sin. Mm. And that is not the case at all. So many of them arrive in the spirit world with all the sins mm. that I've committed in, the, in their life on earth, not being erased because they need to erase it using a different method than believing in me. Mm. And, and this is a very damaging teaching because it causes a lot of them to arrive in, in the spirit world in a dark condition. And then not only that, they go, well, it didn't, my, Jesus' blood didn't save me. Jesus' blood hasn't erased my sin because I still have it in me. I can feel it. So I might, what, what's the point of believing anything yeah. that, that I believed? Yeah. And they throw everything away. Yeah. And that causes them to get into a very dark condition of just doing whatever they want not believing anything, not trusting anybody, not trusting God exists, not trusting that God's love is there for them. So they throw away all these beliefs that could help them mm. as well mm. because, because of that one teaching. Yes. So that's a very damaging thing to do too. The belief about the Holy Spirit is the next uh, damaging belief, I feel, that causes Christians a lot of trouble when they pass. This belief causes them to think that when they were conversing with spirits, that they were conversing with the Holy Spirit. And many people, Christians, get told to do things by spirits that they assume they're being told to do by God. Mm. And this is very damaging to them because they're, they're actually doing things that other people are telling them what to do. Now, if they could see the person, yeah. so it was like me saying, do, go here today, do that today, go there, visit mm. this person. Mm. They'd go, why am I listening to you for? Mm. But because it's a spirit who they believe is the Holy Spirit saying, go here, go there today, do this, do that, they just go and do it willingly. Yeah. They give up their will because of their belief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very damaging thing to do for your future. Mm -hmm. God's trying to help you embrace your will and they are giving up their will yeah. and as a result becoming overcloaked by spirits who are then yeah. assisting them Absolutely. to do things. Is very damaging. Another belief that's very damaging is beliefs about the devil. Mm -hmm. These beliefs have been pre-Christian. They've been throughout the ages, the dark and light concept that there is, if there is brightness, there has to be darkness. Mm -hmm. And this is not true. God created a universe where we chose to embrace the darkness uh, because we had free will to make the choice. Mm -hmm. We could also choose to embrace the brightness mm -hmm. if we wished. And there is no mastermind of darkness. There is no devil, no uh, angel of God who went bad. Mm -hmm. none, of that, none, none of that. Now, the belief in the devil causes a lot of fear. And in fact, if you listen to many sermons that Christian ministers give, they are threatening the congregation with the devil and the devil's got into them and if you listen to this, you're from the devil and if you listen to that, you're from the devil and almost if you listen to anything that's outside of the line of what they believe is truth is from the devil. Mm. And, uh, and this is a great way to control and mm. manipulate people mm. but, a, but a terrible effect on your soul. So many Christians pass over in the spirit world with huge levels of fear yes. about the threat from a devil. Yes. Particularly the Christians who are sincere, who know they've sinned mm. and who don't feel they've been forgiven for it yet. Mm. Those particular Christians are just waiting for the devil to yeah. come when yeah. they pass. And they're in huge amounts of fear, huge amounts of pain and suffering as a result of not realising there is no devil and that the only devils that have ever been present in their life have been evil spirits who have been trying to influence them to do evil things. So um, the, the teachings about the devil are very, are very damaging. The teachings that once you pass, you can't change. Mm. You're either saved or judged. These are very damaging teachings. Mm. What these teachings do is they teach you that you can't make a different choice at a later time. 
And this is a very dangerous teaching. I just need to have a cough. It's a very dangerous teaching because it causes people to, lack, to have no hope. Mm. Mm. Many of them pass into the spirit world, have a relative condition of darkness in compared to what they would like to have had, and then as a result of that feel that they must be in hell, and then they also feel automatically that they can't get out of it, no matter what they do. Mm. And they don't even try mm. as a result. And many of them just sit there waiting to be punished, waiting, mm. like waiting in this place of stagnation because they, they, they've been taught something that causes them to believe that that's what they need to wait for. Mm. Wait for the judgment of God to condi- condemn them to hell. Yeah. And uh, it's a very damaging teaching. It has yeah. a big effect on many Christians as a result, mm. as you can imagine. Mm. Mm. There's, uh, like I'm saying, there's so many, mm. there's so there many must teachings. Be, there must be help for them. There must... I suppose they're just not seeing the help. I understand that. But there must be so many people who really feel so much compassion for these poor people. But see, they've been told that they're, spirit, they're demons as well. Oh. You see, this is a trouble. And there's a, there's quote, they even quote verses of the Bible to you when you're a spirit. I've had, yeah. I've, had, I've had spirits quote to me in the spirit world verses in the Bible that say things like this. Yeah. A, man, a person masquerading as an angel of light. Yes. Now, as I pointed out to people in the first century, you can't masquerade yeah, as an angel of light. Yeah, that'd be a bit difficult, light. wouldn't it? <laughs> it's, it's impossible. Yeah. But, but there are verses in the Bible that state this. Yeah. You, can, you can put on a facade for a short period of time, but as a spirit, it's very difficult to do mm. such a thing. Mm. You can also put on a facade of words and masquerade as light mm. with words, but if someone can look at your person and see straight away whether you have brightness or not. Mm. But that scripture has been quoted to me so many times. Many people have asked for Jesus to come to them when they feel in a degree of pain. Mm. I've gone to them in the spirit world, right, and sat with them, and they tell me to get away from them and, and swear at me and curse me because I'm masquerading as Jesus mm. is their viewpoint. So what can you do to help yeah. such a person? You can only go away and wait for their belief system to change through some kind of interaction they have through the law of attraction with other things. Mm. So, yeah, there's, there's those kind of problems too that occur in the spirit world once a person passes. So I think when uh, you've got a question coming up about, about the shock, you know, what, mm. what happened, how do you cope with the shock of what mm. happens in the spirit mm. world? Mm. And I think what we can do in that uh, discussion is, is talk about some of the reactions that spirits have when they pass, Christian spirit people have when they pass into the spirit world and how they can address some of these problems. Mm. You see, many Christians don't realise that they pass into the spirit world. Things are not as they expect them to be yeah. generally. Yeah. They, they don't sit at the right hand of God with me on a throne as they have been promised. Mm. Uh, they don't, they're not singing hallelujahs, mm. you know, <laughs> in the welcoming stand. They're not, the, all of these things are not happening. In mm. fact, their life seems to continue very similarly as it's continued on okay. earth for the majority of them. And then they start to wonder whether any of their beliefs have been true. Now, there are a lot of Christian beliefs that are true. Mm. You know, God does exist. Mm. There is one God. There is God's love that can be received into the soul. Mm. You know, you do have a soul. Mm. You do have a spirit body. You do, you, you are able to progress. Mm. You are able to live in paradise in the spirit world. There are locations that are paradisaic in the spirit world that you can live in, but they all are available only with the condition of love that the soul reflects. Mm. Now, all of the disciples and apostles who, and, and um, men and women I'm talking about in the first century, who were with me are in the spirit world. Most of them are still there. You could ask any one of them to come to you and talk to you about the first century and what it was really like. Wow. You could ask any one of them to come to you and talk to you about what my teachings were really mm. in the first century. Mm. They can show pictures of what they saw themselves to the minds of the person who asked the question so that you can see what I taught. They can, they can mm. distribute huge amounts of information. There are places in the, in the spirit world where you can get a book like the Bible and in it is annotated every reason for every verse that was ever written. Yeah. 
the person who wrote it, the person who actually wrote it, not the person that it claims mm. wrote it, mm. the person who wrote it, the spirit who inspired it, why they did it, where they were coming from, everything. Mm. These, this information is available everywhere in the spirit world, but only available to the people who are willing to find it, right. who want to find it. And that's where I feel that there is another problem, and that is the Bible itself says, don't listen to anything else. Mm. You know, in the book of Galatians, it says, if anybody comes to you, even an angel in heaven yeah. comes to you, revealing something other than what the Bible has already revealed, don't listen to him. Now, many Christian spirits, when they pass in the spirit world, they take that verse literally. So what they do when they go past in the spirit world, they go, okay, I'm not allowed to listen to anything other than what the Bible says. So if somebody comes to me and tells me something about the Bible, I'll listen to them. But anybody who tells me something that's different than what the Bible says, I don't listen to them. So, so you imagine a disciple of Jesus from the first century or an apostle of Jesus in the first century, male or female, comes to the person in response to their question and starts talking about something that is not contained in the Bible. What do yeah, they do? Yeah. They go, I can't listen to you. You're an apostate. You're, you're not, you, mm. you know, you're bright mm. <laughs> <laughs> without thinking about, oh, that's I feel good when I'm with you. I feel, I feel like I've yeah. progressed. I feel yeah. like going right. somewhere. Yeah. You feel good when I'm with you. And I come to think of it, Jesus did say something about brightness and not holding your life <laughs> under a basket. But, but they forget all of that yeah. because there's this other verse prohibiting mm. the absorption of this knowledge. Mm. And this is the problem. Like the problem with these kind of verses is they lock the person up into stagnation. Mm. They, they, don't, they don't free them. They don't. Mm. Remember I said, and it's recorded in the Bible, the truth will set you free. Yes, yes. It doesn't lock you up yes. into a place. Now, these kind of verses, the verses like in Galatians, where in Galatians 1 where it talks about how you, you, know, you, can't, you can't trust anybody, even a spirit who comes to you or an angel who comes to you who teaches you something other than good news of than what you've been taught, that kind of mentality locks you up into a, only a certain way of thinking. Now, when one of those angels comes to you, they must be an angel for a reason. Mm. They've got to have a lot of love in their soul. Mm. They must have listened to some truth to get to that particular point. And this kind of a verse is basically condemning them mm. and telling you not to listen to them. Now, that is very, very damaging and dangerous. Oh, yeah. And, and it causes the poor spirit to go, I'm not listening to you, I'm not listening to you. I feel like I like you a lot, though. You're not yeah. a person. <laughs> you know, yeah. they're all confused about that and they're confused about the amount of love the person's showing and the person's talking about Jesus and talking about the good news and talking, but, they, but they're also saying about soulmates and they're saying about, you know, other teachings that Jesus isn't God and that the Holy Spirit isn't God and... You know, mm. that there's this divine love and I've never heard of the divine love. Like there's mention of it in the Bible, but, you know, I might not have read about it. And then the Spirit's saying there's no devil. You don't have to worry about a devil. And, and you're saying, no, the Bible has revealed to me all of these things and I can't listen to you. Mm. And unfortunately for many of these Christian spirits, they stay in that state for long periods of time, not understanding why they didn't get what was promised. Mm. You know, I promised mansions in the spirit world mm. to my followers. Mm. And the reason why is because if they follow my teachings as I taught them, mm. they will get into beautiful conditions of love and they'll need a mansion in which to live, mm. just reflecting their beautiful condition of love. Mm. I promised them paradise mm. in the spirit world. Mm. I promised them to be with me in the celestial kingdom of the spirit world, in my kingdom. Now, if they're not there and they're not in paradise and they're not in any of these places that I described and they don't have a mansion of their own, this is an indication that something went wrong. Yeah. And it's not something that went wrong with my teaching. Yeah. It's something that went wrong with the distortion of the teachings. Yeah. And the problem with the belief in the Bible is it contains some of my teachings as well as distortions of my teachings. And if you believe the distortions of my teachings, they will prevent you from having the mansion, mm. prevent you from having the paradise and prevent you from being in my kingdom mm. because it'll be the lack of love that prevents you from being there. Mm. If you understand the teachings as I taught them, then the love will transform your soul and you'll have a mansion and you'll have paradise and you'll have, you know, you'll be in the kingdom. You'll be able to speak with the disciples, the apostles from the first century and every one of them since that have yeah. done the same thing. 
And that's what I would encourage Christian spirits and Christian people on earth after they pass to do. Mm. I would encourage them to focus on getting the information from the people who are bright. Yeah. And, and seeing that if the person's bright, they must know more truth, as I said in the first century. And if they know more truth, then maybe the truth in the Bible isn't the truth. Mm. Maybe I need to change my perspective of what's going on with what I understand from the mm. Bible. And that's what I would recommend a lot of people do. Um, the, probably the last area where I feel that uh, Christians get negatively affected by their teachings is that because there is this internal concept that they are sinners and there's no good in them, mm. They don't trust their emotions very much. Mm. They trust their intellect. Now, the problem with trusting your intellect is that false and true beliefs can exist in your intellect at the same time. But false and true beliefs cannot exist in your soul at the same time. Okay. And if you remove a false belief from your soul, the truth can enter it. Now, many Christians who pass in the spirit world are still heavily trying to use their intellects to resolve the condition of truth. So when you go to them and start speaking about the divine love, they say, oh, but what does the Bible tell me? And they go there, the Bible tells me this, the Bible tells me that, and they look at some contrary area, you know, contradictions in the Bible, and they look at those, and they study all of those, and they say, but I don't understand what you're saying, and they're all trying to do it with their mind. Instead of just engaging this concept that God wants to write the law on their heart. Mm. And their heart is emotional. Mm. Their heart is the feeling centre of themselves. That's their soul. And if they allow their soul to open towards God and have a desire for God from their soul, all transformation can take place. That's how simple it is. And the problem with focusing on the development of the mind and studying things and studying things and studying things and studying things in order to understand them without actually feeling any mm. of them mm. is that your soul is not transformed. Mm. And many Christians pass in the spirit world with heavily developed intellects in, a very, in quite a good moral condition and, and, and many of them in quite a good ethical condition. But because their heart has not been touched by love, they struggle in the spirit world to come to God. Yeah. So these are all different reasons why Christians find, many Christians find it difficult. You'll find that every religion on the planet and every no religion on the planet, every non-religion and no religion on the planet, every single person who's a member of any of those things has a specific set of emotional conditions which determine how easy or hard it will be when they arrive in the spirit world. And, uh, and I'm not saying... There are many Christians that have found it easy because they did not imbibe everything from the Bible that they thought, you know, mm. they thought, oh, that doesn't make much sense to yeah. me. I'm, you know, yeah. I can't accept that. And because of that openness to reason, they easily embrace divine truth. Mm. Other Christians who are very militant mm. and violent in their uh, opinions about the Bible and, and being God's word and so forth, they have spent many hundreds and sometimes thousands of years before they've found the truth. Many of those, though, have found the truth faster than a person who has been a new age, yeah. pra practicer of new age, who has been overcloaked by very dark spirits all of their life. Yeah. And they've passed in the spirit world in a dark condition and they spend a lot of their life just in their addictions. So every single belief and teaching on this planet, even teachings of reincarnation and other teachings such as this, have a huge effect negatively, if they're false, on the future progress of the person, whether they're on earth or in the spirit world. Mm. And if we have compassion for everyone, no matter what, where they've come from, whatever background they've come from, and share whatever we can divine, with divine truth with them, that's going to have a very powerful effect on their lives if they are humble and open mm. to listening to such mm. truth. Yep. And uh, the problem with locked-in opinions is that it makes you not very humble or open to listening yeah. to truth. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, we continue on with question 12. Let's make this our last question, well, okay. in the session. What are the biggest mistakes to avoid for a sincere Christian wanting a personal relationship with God? Well, yeah, this uh, question caused me to think a little bit about um, things. I, I feel the single 
there, there are so many <laughs> mistakes to avoid, as we've been discussing. But I think in my, in my uh, notes of it, I think I, I just felt um, that the single biggest mistakes I felt for a Christian was, were, were to assume that my blood or belief in my sacrifice saves them from their sins and establishes a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. This is a very big mistake mm -hmm. to believe this. What establishes a relationship with God is the desire of the individual to have a relationship with God and to receive divine love through the process of prayer. That's what establishes a relationship with God. If you believe anything else establishes a relationship with God other than that, you will never establish a relationship with God. You may establish a, a lot of relationships with spirits claiming to be God, and you may establish a relationship with spirits claiming to be the Holy Spirit, but they're not God either. Mm. And, and you may establish a whole heap of relationships with spirits claiming to be Jesus, because mm. there's, there's literally hundreds of thousands of them as well but you will not establish a relationship with God. Mm. And I feel the biggest single mistake that a Christian can make is to not establish a relationship with God, not through my blood or any sacrifice that I'm meant to have made, mm. but through desire to know God and love God and have God know them and love them. And I feel that is the biggest single thing I would love to see a Christian change on. Getting away from this viewpoint that I save them in some way, that mm. somehow my blood establishes a relationship with God for them mm. and getting into this concept that their relationship with God is a personal relationship that they personally must desire to establish yeah. before yeah. it can be established. Because when you look at some of the scripture writings, it gets all very dry and legalistic with covenants and this and that. And it does. It, you know, it, it takes away from that, that pure beauty of just having a give and take father child relationship when you're talking about covenants and this and that and well with all the covenants you have to understand them to un from the heart to mm. in order to understand what their meaning is the truth is that god did make a covenant with mankind through myself and and, and this covenant was the covenant of the heart and the covenant of the heart uh -huh. the new covenant is where god will write the law yes the word of God on the heart of the individual who is, in, okay. who is, who is governed by this covenant. Okay. So if a person listens to what I teach, what I actually teach, not what they think I taught in mm. the Bible or mm. what they think I should have taught, mm. <laughs> but rather what I actually teach, they will find that I, I then become the mediator of this covenant for them wow. in the sense that because I've taught divine truth to them, I am now this, I can now help them establish through this covenant that God has made that basically God is saying to all humans, mm. every single human, doesn't matter who they are, God is saying to all humans, no matter how bad or how good they are, I make a covenant with you. I'm going to provide you a person. In this case, it was Jesus. Mm. I'm going to provide you a person who's going to show you how to connect to me mm. to the point where I will be able to write my word on your heart not just as I've write, written my word on his heart. Mm. In other words, you can have God's law written on your heart the same way that Jesus has God's law written on his heart. If you engage the covenant in that regard, then wow. you will come to God. Wow. That, so, so that helps you understand what the covenant is about, right? It does, the new very covenant. much so. But if you, turn, you look at the covenant in terms of a discussion of legalism. Talk about a covenant of blood and law. And all these things. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, you're getting way off line yes. and it becomes very complicated. Also, God made no covenant of blood. If you think, no. about, if you think about it, no. all blood on this planet belongs to God already. Yeah, well, that's it. So how can any of us make a sacrifice yeah. that doesn't already belong to God? Yeah, yeah. We can't. And didn't that come from the old, um, oh, old Middle Eastern belief in Baal? Well, Wasn't he a blood god, you know? A... Yes. Uh, the way, where it came from was that pr prior to pre-Christian times, mm. there were many, many religions who believed in this wrathful god. Mm. And what they believed was they either had to please the gods mm. or sacrifice for the gods. In fact, they believed that pleasing the gods was sacrificing for the gods. They also believed that the way to get 
more from God, if you like, or have God's approval, was to give God the first fruits of whatever you did. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, for many of these religions, it meant the firstborn of their children. Mm. So they would actually, uh, the f child would be born mm. and they'd, they'd have a certain day of the year where they'd actually sacrifice the child. They'd cut the child up and burn it to their God. Right? And they believed that they would, that would actually cause them to then uh, have God's blessing for the rest of the year. Yeah. Does that make sense? Now... Abraham came from these particular yes. belief systems, belief systems yes. and Abraham had more love in his soul. Mm. And he felt, obviously, that these belief systems were, you know, obviously not mm. very loving, right? Mm. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's quite obvious but, to <laughs> us now, but of course, when you're driven by fear, it's not mm. very obvious. Mm. But Abraham had less fear in his soul about, you know, towing the line, line. Mm -hmm. the status quo, as we might say nowadays. So, so he, he felt that there must be another way to connect to God. Now, in doing this, he received inspiration from spirits that God didn't want sacrifice. And in fact, there are parts of the Bible where it says very plainly, God saying, I do not want sacrifice. Yeah. I want obedience yeah. and not sacrifice, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so this is, uh, you know, these are the things that we need to understand, that God doesn't want sacrifice. God would like to have obedience instead. Mm. And that means obedience to God's laws. Whenever we obey God's laws, we'll always be happier. Mm. But we have to voluntarily do so because mm. we have free will. But in Abraham's case, he decided uh, these spirits, um, through this process that he had with his son Isaac, got him to recognise that he didn't need to sacrifice his firstborn anymore. And instead what they did is they substituted animals instead. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so there was still this belief yes. that blood somehow saved or mm. appeased the God. Mm. Abraham believed, was one of the first persons uh, in his neighbourhood who believed in one God, not in many, because mm. it was very popular to believe in many gods. Mm. So he believed in one true God, and, but he still had this concept of God that was quite damaging in the sense that he still felt that God required the sacrifice of a living creature in order to be appeased in some manner or in order to be a sacrifice for his sins, as mm. the saying goes. Yes. Now, this, uh, this became the foundation of, the Jew, of, the, of Judaism mm. and, uh, and the Jewish religion. Now, now, that was around for 1,500 years or so before I arrived on the planet. And, um, and, and I, of course, felt that that was barbaric because I had been to the temple and saw mm. the blood running down the side streets near the temple of all of these animals that were being sacrificed for the sins of people who were committing them next day, generally anyway. And, and they had no effect on God whatsoever, aside from God smelling the stench of the animals being destroyed and killed. And, uh, and that's what caused me to become a vegetarian <laughs> in the first century, which very few people actually know. But if you look at it, that concept of sacrifice through Paul got drawn into Christian religion, mm. faith, religious faith. Now, when I say through Paul, it's through Paul's writings, so-called Paul's writings, but Paul didn't actually believe it either. Okay. So these were modifications okay. to Paul's writings that occurred mm. that, that Paul even himself didn't believe. Right. And, um, but that got added to try to, in, uh, to put together patterns from the Old Testament yes. to the New. Yes, so, they were always trying to reflect back the Old and the New Testament, reflecting back on each other. Exactly. Yes. It was an attempt to draw together yes. what they felt was the Bible canon yes. and explain it um, to people. And so they then called me the Lamb of God mm. that takes away the sin of the world. Mm. Now, I personally cannot take away a single individual's mm. sin. Mm. Um, I can teach them something that will mm. take away their sin, mm. but only if they follow my words, only yes. if they follow my teachings. Mm. That can take away sin. But I personally am not capable mm -mm. through my death of taking away a single person's sin, mm -mm. even my own, mm -mm. <laughs> ironically. <laughs> so so um, these are all teachings that were put together, again, coming from old, mixing it up, mixing it up, mixing it up, in, drawing it into the new, because people find change very difficult. You, mm. you know that. Even now when I'm speaking to groups of people in an audience, you'll hear them saying, so are you meaning that that's what I heard about this? And I'm saying, no, it's not that at all. 
and they go, oh, that's what I thought you were saying. Mm. And, and you know what I mean? That they're always trying to bring in the old yeah. to the new, yeah. rather than just go. Hang on, see, let's just forget the old for a moment and just start off and just way. start fairly fresh. Mm. And let's only bring in the old when it when it sort of aligns with the new. You know, when it makes sense, when it's logical. But most people don't do that, of course. And, mm. and unfortunately, by bringing in the old, they distort the new. Right? Yeah. And this is what happened very rapidly mm. to my teachings. So in the first century, even while I was alive, I had people repeating to me my teachings in the way they understood them, which was not way, the way I was teaching them, while I was alive. Mm. And so it was undoubtedly going to happen when I died. <laughs> wow. Even while I'm alive now, I can reassure people over and over again, no, in the first century, that's not what I taught. And they'll still believe that that's what I taught. Yeah. You know, these, these, these uh, modified teachings get told back to me. Like, I even get told, this is Jesus getting told what Jesus said in the first century. Well, surely Jesus knows what Jesus said in the first century. <laughs> like, and, uh, and this is because people don't believe uh, I'm Jesus, of course, just like in the first century they didn't believe I was the Messiah. Mm. And so they were always trying to bring in the old yeah. to try to make sense of it all. Yeah. And this is also yeah. not a very productive thing in terms of a person's future. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Mm. So my suggestion to, to Christians is... Mm. To, to consider what's being said in these, in these questions and at least consider the bits that they feel they can consider without disagreeing with the disharmony of what they already have inside of themselves yeah. if they want to. Yeah. But understand that when they pass into the spirit world, they have these beautiful options mm. of talking to the people who were with me in the first century. Yes. They have the option of we can, hearing from them. Do they just call for them or they ask just, for them? All they need to do is call for them and they'll come. Mm. And instead of going, oh, no, you're telling me something different to what the Bible says, so I can't listen to you, put that down for a moment. Nothing could be harmed by putting it down for a moment. And listen to the people who were with me in the first century mm -hmm. and ask them, what did Jesus actually say here? Mm -hmm. Right? What did Jesus say about this? Is Jesus God? Is Jesus, is the Holy Spirit God? Is, does Jesus' sacrifice mm -hmm. clear me from my sin? Why mm. am I where I am now? Mm. Ask them the questions and let these bright spirits who obviously have a lot of light, therefore mm. a lot of love, mm. share with you how they have learned mm. to live in love. Are there spirits today who are actually affecting some of the leaders within the church? Because I know, yes. yeah, because I, I, I know there are some teachers and they've been in trouble for some, well, they're always in trouble, but they're in trouble. But they have said, look, is Jesus really God? And they've bringing that into discussion. Yes. They're bringing in, um, um, is it your death that actually, you know, saves, saves or yeah. is it, was it your life? And us copying what copying you did and, 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 and having the same, and trying to do, live our lives the same way that you're living your life. Exactly. And I mean, they're the, they're the questions that they're, that they're bringing in now. Yes. And these are motivated by celestial spirits mm. who know the truth, yeah. who are constantly trying to connect to Christians because they can feel in Christians, there, many Christians have a sincere desire mm. Uh, for a lot, to experience the love of God. And they want to know the truth. And they want to know the truth. Yes. So, so, so you know, these celestial spirits have been for centuries trying mm. to influence ones. And just now, you know, mm. in the modern time, they're starting to have a bit more mm. of an influence on these people yes. to help them get away from actually treating this as God's word mm. and starting to see that God's word no, needs to be read, written onto the heart because yep. th this can't contain God's word. God's word is far greater of and bigger and, and more yeah. incredibly beautiful yeah. than any words yeah. in the English language can describe, or in any language for yeah. that matter. And, and it has to be an experience that a person has written on their heart. Mm. And, and many Christians are now starting to understand this because they have spirits with them who are attempting to help them understand mm. this. Conversely, mm. there are also, also another group of spirits who want everyone to keep the orthodoxy. Mm, you can see that happening right? too. And so now you see a polarisation of the Christian faith mm. occurring where there are Christians who are, who, are, who are developing in love and developing in their understanding 
towards divine truth, mm. towards the real truth, God's mm. truth. And then there are Christians who are very firm and set in their ways, who are almost uh, militantly violent towards the other group of Christians. And, and what I yep. suggest to those people yep. is that violence is never going to help you ever become more loving. Mm. And, and yelling and screaming and condemning people and judging people is directly against your own Bible mm. and directly against my teachings if you are ever going to have a relationship with God. And my suggestion is to give that up as quickly as possible. Mm. But there are groups of spirits helping in both camps. Yes. And, uh, and so there is a bit of a battle, a spiritual battle, if you like, going on at the moment for, for what is right to eventually become a part of what is believed on the mm. planet and in the spirit world, in the mm. lower spheres of the spirit world. Yes. So I feel that's really good. Yeah. Uh, it's a necessary yeah. part of the modification of the Christian faith. If the Christian faith teaches what I actually taught in the first century, it would be a growing, expansive mm. faith. Mm. It, would, uh, it would accomplish huge things on this planet. Mm. Unfortunately, it's accomplished a lot of destruction on the planet because it's that restrictive, violent, mm. un misunderstanding of God as a God of wrath, violence. Mm. And, and, and as I keep saying to people, the God you believe in is the person you also become. Ah. So if you believe in a wrathful, punishing, angry God, you are going to become a wrathful, punishing, angry person. Mm. If you believe in a loving, compassionate, kind God, you will eventually become a loving, compassionate, kind person. Mm. The God you believe in mm. is the God you'll become. Mm. Uh, the person you'll become, I should say. And, and my feelings are uh, that uh, if, for, for the majority of religions on the planet, we need to get away from this dogmatic adherence to words when there is no love. Mm. Now, I understand mm. adhering to words that are all based around love. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. And in fact, I'm very firm about that. Mm. You know, I'll die for that. I won't kill for that, but I'll die for that. Mm. But I certainly would not kill for any reason, mm. let alone a dogmatic, unloving Absolutely. set of teachings. Mm. 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 So that would be my suggestion to Christians who are listening yeah. to these FAQs. Yeah. But we've got, uh, we've got a number of other questions to answer, haven't we, for the future? We so we've we probably got another, another 10 or 12 yes. to answer, at least with uh, yourself. So maybe we can give that, leave that for another week Very and good. answer those sets of questions. Look then. forward to it. <laughs> yeah, it should be good. <laughs> thanks, AJ. Yeah, thanks for your time, Claire. Yeah. <laughs>